The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by that same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in its consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley. I'm here with Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest of the Society of St. Pius V. And he also serves as the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you this evening? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And yourself? Just the same, Father. Great good. to be back. Good. Good to see you. Yes. Father, I know you have lots of prayer requests tonight. Well, yes, I, I do, Tom. Quite an excessive list. And, and yet it... it it's just a, a small sampling of all those we need to pray for. Of course, we, of course, we need to pray for the church. Right? The church is suffering right, right now greatly. Uh, and also the a country, our United States of America, under great attack right now. And uh, I fear uh, paying a terrible price for its sins of abortion. We have to pray for our country's conversion and deliverance from God's wrath. And we... We also have to uh, pray for the soul of a valiant priest who just passed away, Father Campbell, in Texas, just passed away from St. Jude Shrine. Uh, God rest his soul. In fact, uh, the day he, very uh, morning of the day he passed away, I was offering Mass for him at the request of uh, a dear lady in Texas. So uh, when I got word that he had passed away just later on in the day, I was... Uh, well, not entirely surprised because I knew he'd been quite ill. But uh, also, please pray for Father Greenwell. Father Greenwell um, has pneumonia, and we have to pray him through this and get him get him well again. Of course, he's still on his feet, still uh, <laughs> tending the flock, as they say. But uh, <clears throat> I'm sure the, the the pneumonia doesn't help. So, uh, also pray for Father Starbuck and uh, Monsignor Handwerker. Uh, please keep in your prayers for uh, Mr. Paul Riley and his family, but also uh, Rosanna Fiore and Priscilla Sejarto, Pat Tutti and Cheryl Johnson. Our own Jonathan Sapp is, uh, has not been well for some time. Please pray that he recover quickly. It's an ailing him. Remember Margaret Negley and Mary Ruth Kunkel, your own grandmothers, right? Sure. Margaret is still with us in this life, and Mary Ruth passed away recently, right? Yes, sir. This would be her 91st birthday? Yesterday. Is that right? Yes, Yesterday. Yeah. So God, God rest her soul. But please also pray for Maria Bischel and uh, Bernie Kunkel and Monica Condit, uh, and many, many more, okay? As they say this is a, just a small sampling of uh, those who are very near and dear to us here uh, but there are many more who've uh, been referred to us for prayers all of those on the Immac immaculate heart of mary prayer list uh, certainly we should be praying for so uh, that probably represents thousands of people so <clears throat> i know that uh, god blesses us for our charity and, and remembering these dear people in our prayers and uh prayer is one of the things that it uh certainly benefits the one prayed for, but it benefits as much the one who's doing the praying, too. So we've got a lot to ask God for. Okay, very good. Thank you, Father, for that. Um, one uh, big topic we wanted to get into tonight a little bit was um, many of our, our viewers are anxious to know your thoughts on the news that recently came out uh, from the Vatican and, and Francis um, apparently approving um, to some extent uh, some form of, of blessings, so-called, for uh, for 
those living in, in immoral relations immoral relationships um he apparently i guess kind of hinted at this in his response to the dubia the famous dubia that was presented to him some time ago he, he hinted mm. at this uh idea of these so-called blessings and how it was a possibility but now he actually um apparently has uh has published the the norms for this and how how is his clergy is to go about uh, blessing these um these immoral relationships so father what's your uh, response to that they they try and say that uh you know the church's perennial teaching on marriage has not changed whatsoever this does not affect that at all but um the church can certainly they say bless these these unions so how was you uh what was your reaction to seeing this news father well if indeed the uh the directive that came out from the vatican uh, uh following up on francis's own directive i'm sure uh does extend a blessing of the church to same gender relationships uh, that certainly would not only be grossly immoral, scandalous, but it would also definitely affect the church's doctrinal teaching. Um, you know, there are those who are trying to draw the line between uh, the church's doctrine and her pastoral activity. And so they can contradict each other, but the pastoral activity has to be a, an a application of her church's doctrine. And uh, obviously the church is not schizophrenic, but they would make the church schizophrenic by trying to oppose these two things, pastoral practice and doctrine. Um, so if the church does teach, if the modern church of Francis, the modernist church, does in fact teach that these un unions, so-called, these relationships are grossly sinful, moral, mortally sinful, um, that they are totally contrary to the divine purpose, primary essential divine purpose of giving life and so on, um, then allowing these unions to be blessed that make a mockery of that, that actually glorify uh, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, calling down the blessings of the church, which is supposed to be calling down the blessings of heaven, God's own blessing. You know, this is the point. You know, when the church blesses something, it blesses it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so, uh, if they're blessing these immoral unions, uh, this is not like scandalous, but it certainly is uh, a, a direct defiance of the doctrine of the church and in practice denies it. That is, there's no way around it. Now, there are those who are insisting that it's not really a blessing of the union. <clears throat> that um, they're, they're, they're just saying it's not really a blessing at all. It's just actually invoking God to, um, shall we say, spiritually prosper the two people who are receiving the blessing. And it's not blessing the union between them. It's not, according to some. Um, because the blessing between them, the union between them, is uh, sinful and an abomination to God. So it's just actually blessing the two individuals, but as, uh, as individuals. And Bishop Schneider, um, I think, said well, that then bless them individually, but don't bless them together, as though you know you're, you're making it very clear by giving them a blessing in in pairs. <laughs> that that pairing off has to do with a union between the two, and that is what you're blessing. You're blessing them as a couple, so to speak, and you cannot bless them as a couple legitimately. Um, it, it's surprising uh, a bit to see how immediately uh, there were those who began spinning this and making excuses for it. For example, the directive supposedly says, whatever you do, you know, don't, don't imply that this is in any way sacramental. Um, you know, whatever you do, avoid this and avoid that so as not to give the wrong impression. Um, but the fact is, if they're invoking God, well, as someone said, to heal, among other things, to heal these people, uh, and therefore 
this individual said that that implies there's something wrong with them, yeah. something sick, something pathological, and you're actually asking God to um, not bless the relationship between them, but to uh, make it right, right? But to heal the pathology of it. Well, this is uh, quite a, a unique interpretation, <laughs> I think, to try to avoid the reality of it. Francis has already spoken on the subject. He's already given his own spin on the subject. And so when this dicastery has issued this, this, this blessing, uh, it is Francis's meaning that has to be um, understood being behind this, right? Uh, that's how it has to be interpreted. And Francis's own meaning on this is very foul and not Catholic at all. Uh, by the way, I think uh, someone recently pointed out the real danger of this also. I think it does put priests in danger, uh, at least the modern clergy. Um, the priests of the table and not the altar, if you want to put call on that, right? Um, because now that it's permissible in the new order to give this blessing, when people come for it, when two men or women come together for this blessing and seek it, the priests of the new order, the priests of the table, the non-altar, uh, who refuse to give it, could be held liable by law. Someone pointed that out. Because now it's not a matter of church teaching that forbids it. It's a matter of their own personal prejudice that says, I do not accept this. And then uh, legally, the, the accusation came back that, um, that they could be charged legally with actually denying the civil rights of a, uh, a so-called couple of this kind, a same-gender couple, um, on the grounds of personal prejudice. So anyway, this is um, how it's playing out in the Novus Ordo right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, there are so many uh, Novus Ordo clergy right now who are reacting against this, uh, who are not spinning this, who are actually condemning this and saying this is absolutely unacceptable and we will not follow it. Um, I wonder when they're going to finally uh, wake up and smell the incense, so to speak, and realize there's something very foul going on in the Vatican right now, and uh, begin to realize that the the uh, that Francis is a revolutionary, uh, enemy of the Church, enemy of Christ, and um, you know start drawing conclusions from that. Yeah, Father, isn't it uh, a bit silly to say that? Um... To, you know, to, to maintain that this doesn't change any any of the uh, church's perennial teachings on on marriage, because even even if that were true, I mean, if you're changing what uh, what the people do, if you're changing the people's actions, that's eventually going to change their their beliefs. We, we saw this with the with the new mass, where even if uh, you know if they present a Protestant, essentially a, a Protestant service to them. Um, mm -hmm. People are worshiping in this way. This is what the people are doing. Eventually, they're going to start believing and, and mm -hmm. thinking and, and believing like like Protestants. So, if we have uh, where they're blessing these these unions, I mean, eventually people are going to actually start believing in these these unions. If that's not the case already, they're going to actually mm -hmm. think that they are. Um, you know, Typical modernist behavior, behavior, a little bit gradualism, little by little. You're right, Tom. Yeah. Absolutely. In practice, they get people doing things uh, that really are acting contrary to what they're supposed to believe, and it destroys the faith. Yeah. Wouldn't it be a very small step from here, just to, I mean, you know, in a matter of years, or, or if it's even that long, to say that, you know, well, we've been blessing these unions all this time, so they must be fine, so we're going to actually, you know, sure. go ahead and officially approve these. Well, look, look at how many of the uh, Nova Soto clergy are all about, in, all in favor of this. Oh, yeah. And this gives them license now. Um, this gives them license to just uh, pontificate over these uh, unions and, and uh, you know, proclaim them, uh, you know, certainly acceptable in the eyes of God, right. truly uh, holy and uh, consecrated. I mean, they'll, they'll just go wild. 
and uh, making much of this. Even this uh, James Martin, so-called Jesuit, is already saying this is a, a great step forward, you know, toward the acceptance of the homosexual lifestyle. You know? Yeah. So, um, lifestyle, so-called. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right, Tom. This is, this is just... Um, well, it it is what the what the actual uh, homosexuals are already calling it, right? A victory for them yeah. and a victory for their their side, their position, and those who are trying to dismiss it as being inconsequential are basically. Uh, well, they're, I think they're lying to themselves. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um... Certainly not, uh, not, not the a good thing. news, Father. But, no, um, no. Anything that would, uh, um, shall we say, uh, you know, but God, God condemned Sodom and Gomorrah for these immoral acts, yeah. contrary to nature. Anybody who would try to, uh, shall we say, uh, normalize them, or rehabilitate them, um, uh, and even bless them is no friend of God, yeah. right? Well, Father, um, you've uh, recently been uh, making the case that uh, Francis is um, a, uh, a neo-pagan, the, the term you've used, neo-paganism, you've referenced that, and also the uh, environmental Gnosticism, but one of our viewers wrote us a very very good email um, asking about uh, these, these two ideas, and he asked if Catholics have a, uh, if they have a responsibility, um, if it's important for Catholics to have a proper understanding of nature, what the Church actually teaches of, of nature, um, since we see in Francis this neo-paganism, this um, environmental Gnosticism. So would you say that, that Catholics particularly today have a responsibility to uh, maybe to learn to live off the land or, or to learn to the uh, Church's actual teaching on the proper relationship they should have with nature? Is that very important today? Well, I don't know if they have to have an obligation to learn to live off the land, you know, homestead, but I think it'd be very prudent for them under the circumstances um, prevailing today, you know, those who want to uh, feed us on a diet of insect flour, <laughs> I think people would be very prudent to uh, learn to live off the land, capable of doing so. Um, I think there are those who want to reduce us to um, uh, basically uh, subsistence level existence. Um, so if we want to Avoid that. We're going to have to begin to provide for ourselves, right? Um, but you know, is it necessary for Catholics to have a proper understanding of nature? Well, of course. I mean, Catholics, insofar as we have to have an understanding of who God is, in order to understand who we are. I mean, we're creatures, right? As soon as we realize we're creatures, well, uh, we realize we have a Creator. And the Creator has made us for a reason, His own reason. And in divine revelation in sacred scripture, we learn that God created us in His own image, and but with sanctifying grace in His own likeness. And so, uh, if we are indeed created in the image of God, then we have to know who God is in order to know who we are as His image, our real identity, our real purpose. Um, but then we have this whole creation and uh, around us, and St. Paul tells us that all of creation speaks to us of God, of its creator. And so, yes, we, we do have an obligation to appreciate God's creation uh, and to appreciate its, its creator. Um, you know, the whole idea of neo-paganism is to live in harmony with nature. When God created us, he said that we should increase, multiply, fill the earth, but we should subdue the earth, okay? And have it serve our purposes as we are serving God's purposes. Now we have rebelled against God's purposes for ourselves, and so nature has rebelled against us too. Unfortunately, we're trying to use nature in order to um, enable us to live in defiance of God, we keep telling ourselves we're going to create some kind of a paradise, a recreate paradise for ourselves here on earth. Um, paradise including, which includes sin. And so we don't have to repent of anything 
We don't have to uh, stop sinning against God. We can create our own paradise, not only without him, but in spite of him. And we're going to use nature to do that. Um, but um, this is obviously a, not only a, a pipe dream, but it is a nightmare. Uh, because nature will, will definitely turn, uh, you know, not serve that purpose. Uh, will not serve our sinful purposes without some terrible price to pay. Mm. Now, um, you know, one has to be careful, though, because one can say, well, we have to live in harmony with nature. Well, isn't that what the neo-pagans are saying? Isn't that what Francis is saying? Well, when we say we have to live in harmony with nature... Uh, we're saying that we have to live in harmony with God, who is the, the creator of nature. And uh, we have to live in harmony with nature insofar as God has given a place here. That's not what the neo-pagans are saying. That is not what Francis is saying in his Laudato Si or you know, his other encyclical, whatever. He, he is actually thinking... Both of these actually take their rise to the modernist idea that God is imminent, that God is in nature, and that we must find God in nature. We are part of nature, and God is in us too, in our psyche and so on. But uh, they, new pagans have the idea there is like a, an ancestral religion of all mankind. And the ancestral religion, even before the paganism of the Greeks and the Romans and all that, with their gods and goddesses, they say they're the, the natural in, uh, ancestral religion of all mankind is finding God in nature. Right? God lives in rivers. He lives in forests. He lives in the birds and the bees. He lives in the grass and the trees. He lives in these things. And that's where we have to find God, because that's where he really is. In other words, it's pantheism, yeah. right? Animism, whatever name you want to give it, it's God is imminent in nature. Uh, that's where God's existence really is. So we can talk about Mother Earth Gaia, and we can talk about Gaia as feeling and as reacting and as being angry with us because we are abusing uh, the resources of the earth and all that. As Francis goes on and on about that in his Amazon Synod, Amazon Synod and so on, it was all about that. But, but the idea is that Francis, as a neo-pagan, wants to um, return that ancestral religion to all of us as the one world religion. He wants to restore what the neo-pagans regard as the ancestral religion of all mankind, evolved mankind. <laughs> and he wants that ancestral religion of the deity being imminent in nature to become the new religion of the new order. And so all that he writes and says, uh, it's all directed that way. Even in glorifying the indigenous religions of, of the past, he's actually reaching back to the so-called ancestral religion of mankind, uh, believing that God is, is in, the, the, in nature all around us, and uh, that that is where we have to find him. The, the fundamental idea of modernism, as you know, is the, the definition of faith as your experience and my experience, the individual's experience of God. And where do we experience God? We experience God in nature. Okay, perfectly attuned to neo-paganism. And when you start with that, just start with that principle that you're going to you're going to experience God in nature, and that is the source of all true faith. That that leads ultimately and inevitably to neo-paganism. It's the fundamental principle of neo-paganism as well. And that is what Francis is actually implicating right now. So, um, if you if you know what, if you if you look at the neo pagan sites on on the internet, which I don't necessarily recommend because there's a lot of evil stuff out there. But 
they give you these point-by-point -point descriptions of what neo-paganism stands for. And you read what Francis himself has written, you listen to his speeches, and you see what he's done. For example, going to Canada, taking part in these so-called indigenous rituals in which he himself was going through the motions to summon the spirits from the four winds. And uh, you realize that's all part of neo-paganism, you know. Um, and you, you see that this one consistent theme of, of Francis really is the neo-pagan message. Um, that is not what the same as when we as Catholics say, we believe that God created nature, but nature is not God, and God does not live in nature. You know, uh, there is a transcendent God who is the creator of all, and above all, he's not just the sum total of all the energy in the universe. He is the creator of the sum total of all of the enemy energy in the universe, which makes him infinitely greater than all the sum total of the energy in the universe. So uh, there's a, a, an enormous difference between a Catholic saying, yes, we have to respect nature because we respect the creator, we have to respect nature for the purpose for which God created it. And God created it to serve man, mankind, who is supposed to rule the earth in an intelligent way, in a, in a reasonable and thoughtful way, as kind of a steward of God's creation, answerable to him, responsible to him. But man is not a nature worshiper. Man does not worship nature as though it is his God. But that's what the neo-pagans what have you do. And that is what Francis would have you do. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, another question, Father. One of our viewers wanted to know if we... Yes. Actually, the word, <laughs> the word cultivate comes to mind here. Mm -hmm. You know, the Latin word cultus means like a worship, right? And so, you know, we, we have... Or to tend or to care for... And uh, we talk about the divine cult in this in a good sense, meaning our worship of God. Okay, mm -hmm. cult did not have a bad sense originally; it had a good sense, meaning recognize the sovereignty of God in thought, word, and action too, acknowledging that. And the word cultivate comes from that, and God has given us the commission, as it were, to cultivate the earth, uh, not in the sense of worshiping it. Unfortunately, the, uh, the neo-pagans and, again, Francis himself, you know, um, um, has basically turned the tables on the idea, cultivating the earth, not to worship it, but to serve God who created it and gave us, you know, the intelligence and the will to know and to love and to appreciate the beauty of it and to bring out the goodness and the beauty that is there, to bring that out, um, to exercise a certain creative power in our inventiveness and so on. God wants that from us. He gave it to us for that purpose, to cultivate the earth. But that doesn't mean we are to worship it and to put this nature, the creature, in the place of God and say that, well, now God is not transcendent, now he's imminent, we, we are going to find him um, actually now in the creatures that he's made, that this becomes um, the sight of God for us. This is very bad. It, it is actually uh, an abomination in God's eyes. It is apostasy. Um, you know, somebody recently pointed out that this recent synod that Francis held said that the experiences, the, the faith experiences of the individual believers are theological places. Now, the term a theological place or site has a, a very specific meaning in theology, that you find revelation in that. 
So, you know, you would say that sacred scripture and sacred tradition are theological sites where we go to develop theological understanding from divine revelation. And God makes himself known, God makes himself known through these sites for theology, you know. So when the synod came out and said that the individual personal experience of the believer experiencing God in nature, right, is a theological sight, saying this is, this is actual divine revelation that is taking place. That is, that is sheer modernism. And I hear people saying, that's not right. You can't say that. But I don't hear anybody saying, this is exactly what St. Pius X condemned is encyclical against modernism, condemning the errors of the modernists. But this is, this is textbook modernism. Read the encyclical Pascendi. It's all there. It's as though Francis finds the script <laughs> right there in everything that St. Pius X condemned in his condemnation of the, of the errors of the modernists. Hmm. So I thought it was really uh, interesting to read an article, a, a gentleman who obviously sees that this is dead wrong to say that, that the ex experience of the individual believer is actually divine revelation, you know, uh, has the status of a theological place. Um, and yet it amazed me that he didn't make the connection. But this, you see, this is exactly the point. This is what exactly was in Pius X foresaw coming and exactly what he condemned. So why are we still wringing our hands thinking, well, how can Francis do this? He's a modernist. He's a textbook modernist. And, you know, read Pascendi and there you find not only the account of what Francis has done, but the account of where he's going with this and what his ultimate objective is. It's going to be a pantheon, a panth uh, pantheism, and it's going to be the um, one world religion of, of uh, well, what we now know as neo-paganism. Yeah. So it's a form of Gnosticism, yeah. as uh, a very thoughtful person recently said. Yeah. But, I, I just um, that just reminds me of a, a story I think you you told some time ago, Father. You um, mentioned how uh, some years ago one of the uh, one of your parishioners took you out on the uh, on the golf course actually, and you uh, at some point fell in with uh, with with some stranger in your in your foursome, I guess. And he um, I, I guess was a pretty avid golfer. And at some point um, on the course, he threw his hands and said, this, this is my church, or this, this is, is my, my cathedral. This is my cathedral. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just brought that to mind when you were uh, talking about the neo paganism. That's where he worships. Yeah. But, um, okay, well, moving on, Father, one of our viewers wanted to know if we have a right to be happy. Can we say that? No. <clears throat> we don't have the right to be happy. Even the founding fathers of our country did not say we have a right to be happy. They said we have a right to pursue happiness, the right, the pursuit of happiness, right? But uh, even that, you know, needs to be qualified here. Um, human beings are creatures and um, our happiness must be found in God and in serving God. To that extent, we have a right to serve God and we have a right to be faithful to God, right? But we have no right to defy God. You see, the, the problem with that idea of saying, I, I have a right to be happy, don't I have a right to be happy? Is basically the modern idea of entitlement. If, if, I, if I say, I have a right to be happy, then essentially what I'm saying is that I have a right to whatever I want, basically, it's going to sound to. I have a right to whatever I want because I want happiness, and whatever is necessary to make me happy, I have a right to that. And that is a sense of entitlement. This is what we're meeting with in the world today. This is gross worldly thinking. It's the mentality of a woman who says, I have a right to be happy. I'm going to, I'm going to abort this baby. This baby is denying me my happiness that I have a right to. 
And uh, the baby's right to exist or right to life, the life that the mother gave the baby, right, is of no consequence compared to the woman and her right to be happy. But her right to be happy can extend to just about anything. Uh, putting to death an, an elderly relative she's taken care of because this relative takes too much time and effort. It's a real bother to me. And this relative is contrary to my happiness. <coughs> Get ridding, getting rid of, you know, uh, grandparents, spouses, children, because they are uh, somehow in the way of my happiness. It's the same type of thing with the gangbangers out on the street here. <clears throat> you know, they, they have an entitlement to whatever they get and, and whatever they want, such if they, if they don't get it, they have a right to take it. And um, anybody who withholds it from them is, is denying them their rights. Um, so, you know, it's come to this, this idea, I, I am, and because I am, I have a right to whatever I want because of my personal existence, right? This was Satan's idea. This was Lucifer's idea. <coughs> idea, I have a right to be happy in my own way. I have a right to be happy unto myself and not to be dependent about a God who made me. I have a right to that. And I'm going to take that. And I'm insisting on, on, uh, on just, you know, defying God and not being subject to him I'm subservient to him and finding my happiness in him. I am adequate unto myself. I'm entitled to be happy. I deserve to be happy. I'm going to be happy without him. That's where it all started, though. Um, we human beings, as creatures, we owe our existence to God. And owing that, uh, we come into the world uh, from our very first instance of, of uh, existence. Uh, owing, owing everything we have and everything we are to Almighty God, a Creator, then we owe Him our our love, our service, and uh, this is what we call our vocation. That when God creates us, He creates us to accomplish something. A vocation. A vocation is a life of service. It is. Lucifer said. I will not serve. That's how he's quoted in sacred scripture. I will not serve. But a vocation is a life of service. And as a life of service, it is also going to be a life of sacrifice. And um, that life of sacrifice is um, joyful when it is motivated by love. When it's um, slavery... Uh, and against our will, because the love is not there, then it becomes an intolerable burden. Well, again, you know, that's what sin does. That's what sin does to us. It makes uh, a, what should be a labor of love into an intolerable burden of slavery. That's how sin transforms and, and, and darkens and poisons our minds against the very purpose of our own existence which is to be loved by God and to love him in, re in return. And this world, and to be happy with him in that, great, in that love in heaven. So this, this whole idea that I deserve to be heavy, happy, if, if it has the sense that uh, I'm entitled to happiness no matter what, and um, happiness, happiness is whatever serves my purposes, and pleases me, that's very much the existential idea of, uh, of, of happiness that our young people are being taught in the colleges and universities today. Make your own happiness, get your own happiness any way you can. And everything else and everyone else around you exists to serve your happiness and make you happy. Um, this is abominable. This is satanic, actually. Eh? Yeah. Okay. No, happiness is not something that, um, like, you know, like little babies who can, well, I'm hungry, feed me, you know, I, I, I want to be burped and I want to be, you know, we have to get beyond that. This is, this is the infantile uh, mentality before there can be any, any real virtue developed in the soul.
Um, but that mentality is is not worthy of uh, of a um, of a, a mature human being, of course, who who knows and loves God. So anyway, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Father, one of our viewers wanted to know your thoughts on uh, postmodernism. He said he's come across this term. Um, he says uh, that uh, he, he's read that uh, essentially modernism, when it uh, was coming about, that it produced two different reactions, two kind of opposite reactions. One was this postmodernism, the other was, was traditionalism, a return to actual mm -hmm. uh, real traditionalism. But he said on the other end of the spectrum, he's, he said there's, the, there's this uh, postmodernism. Have you heard of this, Father? And, uh, I've heard of postmodernism, sure. What have you thought? I've heard it applied mostly to uh, arts, architecture, um, but it seems to all be based on the idea of a rejection of the rational, the intelligent, objective truth. And it makes sense because if modernism, I mean, we, we talk about modernism and religion, okay? But modernism is a, a, a large movement across the spectrum of arts and sciences, really. Um, and uh, modernism... Uh, very much um, was a movement away from anything objective. Okay, for example, Saint Pius X starts that with that in the encyclical condemning the errors of the modernists in religion, and saying they they start with phenomenalism, and they start with agnosticism. He said these two false philosophical tendencies. He says these these false philosophies then breed. The religious modernism, um, uh, ph phenomenalism, uh, says that there is kind of a gulf between the human mind and reality. It all goes back to the epistemological questions of the 1400s, 1300s, and so on. Like, how do we really know reality? What is the real connection between our our minds and the world around us? Is there any real connection? Do I know reality, or is it just a show? Can I really get to the nature of things and understand what's out there, or am I just kind of catching the mere appearances and superficial, um, and reacting to the superficial things? It's like it's like a mirage almost, you know. So um, eventually, it comes down to well, you know, you could go through Cartesian philosophy, which gets a little. Um, it goes off in so many branches these days. But essentially, the, the whole idea of the progression, you know, um, Kant and Hegel and all the rest of them, is uh, to basically sever the human mind consciousness from reality and saying, no, we cannot know what is real. We can only know the, the appearances of things as though everything could be an illusion, right? Um, which is actually a denial of the fact that God made us in his own image, right? It is an attack on the very idea of the creator making us, designing us to know truth. This is what, what is being destroyed there. Um, so, um, you know, you, you start with that idea that there is a... Um, a division, let's say, a, uh, a severance. You sever the human mind, to lobotomize the human mind from reality around us in the world. On the one hand, and then you invoke agnosticism and say, but just as I cannot know the reality of the things in the world, I can only kind of enjoy the show. So I can't know God. I can't know anything about God himself. I can't even know his existence. Agnosticism. So I think, okay, maybe there's a God I have no way of knowing. And if there is a God, I have no way of knowing who it is and what he is. So you start with this idea of severing the human consciousness or awareness or the human mind from the uh, anything real around us that we can just kind of enjoy the show around us. And we can't know anything about God and what's left. 
And uh, that's because we have to explain certain things, as the modernists would say. We have to explain where, do, where does faith come from? If you can't know God and you can't know the reality of the world around you, then there is something, a phenomenon called faith. And where does faith come from? And the modern answer is, each one of us has to basically have an have experience of God in nature. Again, remember, nature is kind of a show, okay? But we experience God, each one of us experiences in his own way, God in nature. And that is the source of all faith. That's where the, the modernist begins developing his entire religious idea, right? Uh, based upon that individual experience of God somehow manifesting himself in nature, sort of like through this disguise of nature. Um, I know it sounds kind of strange, but you'd have to go to Pashendi and read it for yourself. St. Pius X explains it, um, as well as it can be explained. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the idea of all this I, is to start drawing the mind of man away from objective reality, truth, and the order that is in truth and objective reality. And basically say we're reduced to our own impressions, our own thoughts, our own feelings. And, you know, following, following that, the neo-pagans say, as Francis himself has said, we don't want doctrine because doctrine is true rigid. It's like an objective truth. We have to get away from that. No, the imagination is the key. The imagination is the key where we have to develop our imagination very much like we can't know the objective reality of the world around us, so we're left to the imaginations within our own minds to work with this, develop this, and make a world for ourselves of our own creation by the power of our imagination. And um, the neo-pagans actually base their religion on this imagination working in this phenomenalistic world, as it were. Um, I know it sounds a little bit esoteric, perhaps, but starting with this idea in modernism uh, that severs the mind from objective reality and says reality is what's going on in your mind, especially in your imagination. For you, that's your reality. Then you can see how postmodernism would go a step beyond that and basically go contrary and say, okay, we're going to actually have a kind of rebellion against reality. And we're going to produce the weird and the twisted and the unconventional. So, you know, whereas before you might say architecture was, you know, put up a building, maybe it was very beautifully ornate in the old days, now it's just a block. <laughs> like, now the, the neo-modernism is going to make it a train wreck with things jutting out here and jutting out there, no rhyme or reason to it, just chaos. Mm -hmm. And postmodernism tends in the direction of like a rebellion against the constraints of what was perceived as order in the old days, you know? So it kind of canonizes disorder. The, again, the imagination kind of run amok, mm. you know? And um, so, you know, I think our inquirer here about postmodernism in saying that <laughs> modernism inspired postmodernism, I think it was a step on the way to you know, modernism kind of rejection of the objective reality and postmodernism as a rebellion against objective reality. Does that make sense? It does, but okay. would, uh, thank would, you. would say, <laughs> is, is traditionalism then the well, other? The next spectrum? step. Is that what you would traditionalism say? is not a reaction to modernism. It's a restatement of the faith. That's all it is. It is a restatement of the faith because those who are traditional key, I'm talking about traditional Catholics now, okay? As a, as a religious traditionalism, we're talking not... You see, 
anyway, th there's a, an actual religious movement called traditionalism, which the church did condemn, but it's not being traditional as Catholics. It was the idea hundreds of years ago that um, the generations that followed Adam and Eve uh, carried the traditional remembrance of their origins and um, that basically a religion could be built upon that remembrance of, you know, just tradition handed down from generation to a generation, like in the Old Testament and so on. But that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Uh, as far as if he's talking about traditional Catholicism as it is now, traditional Catholicism is not simply a reaction or a development from modernism. It is, uh, as any traditional Catholic will tell you, simply a, a restatement of the faith for what it has been. And uh, what we have received of the faith, as St. Paul says, of Scripture and tradition. So, you know, traditional Catholics did not simply invoke Catholic tradition and hold on to Catholic tradition as a reaction against modernism. Because, well, I reject modernism, so I must be traditional to do that. They simply wouldn't change. When the modernists were imposing their new principles and changing everything according to their new principles, they introduced their new faith and they were introducing the new religion to correspond to their faith, then those who had the traditional Catholic faith, the old faith, said, no, we don't accept your new religion because we don't accept your new faith. We're still holding on to the old faith. That's not a reaction. That's just simply a reassertion of what I believe. And no matter what heresy might be out there, my faith is not a re reaction to that heresy. I just hold steady, hold, hold fast. That's what St. Paul said. I just hold fast to what my convictions always were as Catholics. My convictions as Catholic are the same convictions that my, my previous generation of Catholics the generation before them, the generation before them, going back to the very, very apostles themselves. So my faith is apostolic. My faith is not a reaction. My faith was not produced by modernism as some kind of a reaction against it. Yeah. My faith condemns modernism even before, if, even if there were no modernists. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's the perennial... Uh, Catholic faith. Yeah. It's unchangeable Catholic faith. That's all. Yeah. Very good. That's a, uh, an interesting discussion. Father, thank you. Um, we're running a bit short on time, Father, but I was very interested to uh, hear what you thought on this uh, question of homeopathy. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some of our viewers ask about that, what you thought of it, if you would uh, have any concerns with any... Uh, traditional Catholics um, inquiring, looking into, practicing this homeopathy. Any thoughts on that, Paul? Um, Well, you know, a homeopathy, I'd heard the, the word used before, uh, for years now. It was never really quite clear of what it, what it was, uh, but um, it seems to be basically a Germ German development. Um, we, we have... Um, in the, in the, and in fact, I think you pointed that out, Tom, you pointed that out to me, that uh, homeopathy actually is mentioned not favorably in the Catholic Encyclopedia. And I'm not talking about the, the modern Catholic Encyclopedia, I'm talking about the Catholic Encyclopedia, I think 1911, 1913, under the heading of medicine, the history of medicine. And... Homeopathy does have a, uh, occupies some of the attention there, uh, is mentioned not only in one, but actually two places, right? Um, so, um, and, and not favorably. Uh, homeopathy seems to revolve around the idea that, um, let's see if I can state it correctly, you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, 
um, that if if something, uh, some treatment, some remedy, or some some drug, or or some element, whatever, to be general as possible, causes certain symptoms in a healthy person, then that's an indication that that same element, if it were given to a sick person, could cure those very same symptoms. That's Is that my, fair? That's my understanding. They say that like cures like, I think that's what they Like, um, Well, that's where the word the homeopathy comes from, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, in other words, if it can produce these symptoms, then we can use it to cure this in one person, a healthy person. We can use it to cure the same symptoms in a sick person. And that's done through their very, very diluted um, remedies, they're called, that they administer to the sick person to produce those effects, to produce those reactions. Now, let me ask you, okay, if I understand you. So, if you can, let's say, use a drug or a chemical or whatever it is, and you can introduce this to a, a, a healthy person and produce certain symptoms, uh, pathological symptoms, then you can take that chemical and you can dilute it down and dilute it down and dilute it down. And then introduce that into the system of a sick person who is having those symptoms that you induced in the other healthy person. And that diluted solution will cure the sick person of those very same symptoms. And something about the vital energy, the vital energy of the sick person will then be able to overcome the symptoms because of this chemical that was introduced, right? Like that. Um, well, it's, it's a curious theory, but it's hard to see how there's any rational foundation for it. I think that's what the Catholic Encyclopedia actually says about it. It's hard to see any real rational foundation for it, or any actually good, sensible, reasonable explanation for how that would work. Um, I think there was even a statement saying that it, it might have looked somewhat successful in light of other false ideas at the time, which were kind of outrageous and did more harm than good. So maybe homeopathy looked like a better alternative, but it it doesn't make sense, like cures like, to induce symptoms. And in fact, I think the idea was that if you can induce those symptoms using a chemical in somebody's body, that's an indication of, then that shows you you can cure those symptoms with that same substance in somebody else. Mm-hmm. So you can, they actually said something about they, they can identify the disease by the chemical that cures it. Right? Something like that. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm not a physician, obviously, um, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> and I'm good content with that. But um, even from a rational point of view, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Right? Yeah. And... Uh, you know, now, you know, I'm not a great believer of modern medicine, you know that, because of modern medicine has been turned into a business, and it's been turned into almost a cult these days, and uh, a means of controlling the masses. As G.K. Chesterton said, he said, uh, and he, he was saying this back in the 1930s, that he foresaw that medicine would be the instrument used to basically control mankind, to gain dominion over all mankind. Um, so I, I believe that he's right. And I think we've seen exactly that happen here recently. It can be weaponized, but, um, but it's still hard to see how homeopathy, if this is what it really is, uh, how that can have any validity to it. Mm-hmm. Do you see any dangers in it, though? Would you recommend Christian Catholics stay away well, from it? Well, so far they're talking about the vital energies and all that other stuff. I mean, you know, what comes to my mind when I hear that is, again, the encyclical of St. Pius X on modernism, because he mentions this vital imminence. Yeah. 
And it's not the same thing, clearly, as the vital energies spoken of by the homeopathist. But still, there's something peculiar that kind of rings similar uh, between what St. Pius X talks about, how you have vital imminence in someone having the experience of God, and that this will uh, then have a certain vitality because... Um, uh, you know, if it, if it thrives, if it takes on a life of its own, people begin to flock around it, want to share that experience of God, this vital imminence will make it thrive and even grow into a world religion or something like that, you know. Um, the, the vital, anything, these vital energies kind of concern me when they start talking about these things because it makes you wonder um, one, could, one could actually, I, I think, begin to look at this in sort of a spiritual, rit ritualistic, and even a cultic way. Yeah. From, from what I can see of homeopathy, uh, it seems to me that it could lend itself to um, almost a kind of a, a, an aspect of a false religion. All right. Um, and uh, I mean, I could explain that at length, but I won't. <laughs> okay. If somebody has any interest in knowing uh, why I say that, I'd be glad to explain it. Okay. okay. But it does concern me. Is this uh, is this big out there? Right now? I mean, I've heard the name. I've heard the the, the, the homeop. I've heard of homeopathy for years now. But I I. Um, I don't know how much weight to put upon it. Uh, do you hear about this as being a, a thing right now in the, for people? Uh, well, it's very popular. I, I wouldn't say that I'm, that I'm very connected. I might not be the best person to ask, but I, I think I have. I, uh, it does seem to be gaining popularity, I would say. I, it seems that I, I've heard a, a fair, fair amount about it, but I think uh, you made the point earlier that uh, there's just so much, and I think rightly so, opposition to you know your... Um, the the modern medicine nowadays. So I think people are looking. There, I think modern medicine is driving people looking for to look as an alternative for for things like this. So I think maybe that's one reason why um, it seems to be gaining popularity mm -hmm. is because people are looking for alternatives to the. But when you see that, though, when you see them, uh, you know, gaining in popularity, do you, is it kind of a, a religious fervor almost behind it? Um. That if you question it, like you're uh, some kind of heretic or. <laughs> Possibly a little bit, a little really? bit, yeah, a little yeah. bit. But again, I'm not. I'm definitely not an authority on the subject, so I wouldn't, right. wouldn't be the right person to ask. But uh, I can say I've seen that a little bit. Okay, uh, just, yeah. just curious. When you see something without a lot of uh, seeming rationality or yeah. as the actually official evidence for it, yeah. you can see how how it could then become part of an overall religious almost a faith-based sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, I would be very wary of that. Yeah. You know, so. What I've heard is just a lot of anecdotal evidence from people are saying this worked really well for me, so you should mm -hmm. try this. I but, see. Yeah, okay. not a lot of rational thought behind it. Mm -hmm. um, I see, okay. Yeah, so. Okay, well, I think we can stop there, Father. Um, we've got uh, a few more questions that we can yeah. uh, just add to the list for next time. Well, I would like to take an opportunity to thank people. I, I mentioned the Christmas appeal. Yeah for Immaculate Conception the Church and School. And um, our viewers, a number of them have responded generously to support the Christmas Appeal, and it's very much appreciated, very much needed. Thank you for your generosity. God bless you for it. I even mentioned the new steps leading into the back of the, uh, the uh, old building. You know, our buildings are very old. I mean, our high school building was built in 1911. Uh, 1910, 1911, with the cornerstone, and um, the church celebrating its 100th anniversary of completion uh, next year. So um, uh, it's a great deal involved in maintaining it, and someone actually sent a donation in for to help with the steps, yeah. uh, which is very practical, and very necessary, and uh, very much appreciated. So thank you, thank you for your generosity in that. 
Absolutely. We also, uh, Father, mentioned the uh, recently mentioned the Etsy shop, and we've had a lot of orders on there. With right. our, um, the uh, 2024 Roman Catholic calendars, those have uh, been very <clears throat> popular. I think uh, we have more of those available now, I, I believe, and um, sold through a lot of those. But a lot of the other great products on Etsy, we sold through a lot of those, mm -hmm. um, but we still have, have more definitely to sell on there. So uh, any of our viewers, if they're still interested in that, but also... Um, we uh, we mentioned uh, the uh, liking our, our videos and even right. on on Rumble. Um, it's called the clicking the, the Rumble button on our on our videos, and uh, we had a great response to that from our from our viewers as well. So, right, um, appreciate and, that. That yeah, makes the go. program more visible, right? That's the plan. Yeah. So that that all helps certainly. Yeah. And uh, I I I have the sense that we're probably going to hear from some homeopathists. <laughs> okay. So we'll be looking for uh, like anything that you have to say about that. Okay. Well, maybe we'll do a part two next time, Father. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's right. Father, thanks for being here tonight. Um, appreciate your time. God bless you. And oh, uh, thanks, an Advent season to you. And, I wish yeah, you the same. God bless you. See you again Blessed soon. Christmas. Yes. All right. And Christmas season. Okay. That's right. Thank you to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.